course, no man has ever been on the moon. Not yet. But through long years of study, astronomers have learned many things about it. So many things they can tell us what it might be like to visit the moon. Rockets are able to carry Earth satellites into space and may soon be able to make this trip to the moon. Here is our imaginary craft, ready for the blast-off. Five seconds, four, three, two, one, and we're off at a terrific speed. Faster and faster. As we move away from the Earth, the sky grows darker because the Earth's atmosphere, the blanket of air and dust that makes our ordinary daylight sky appear blue, is now far below. Up here, a hundred miles or so, we change course to break away from the Earth's pull of gravity on our ship. We are now far above the Earth, higher than man has ever flown before. Already the Earth appears curved like a ball. Above the Earth's atmosphere, there is no air or dust to make the stars twinkle. These are the stars of the constellation Orion. Notice how brilliant the stars and moon appear against the pitch black sky. Before we get too far away, let's take a good look at our own planet. Here we show it turning, but actually to our eye it would appear to be motionless. Perhaps you can recognize the continents and oceans. Look, far out in the Pacific Ocean, the day is ending. The soft shadow line is called the Terminator. Everywhere along this line it is sunset. Directly on the opposite side of the Earth, you can see the sunrise line. It's sunrise all along this line. The Earth's rotation on its axis makes each Terminator line seem to sweep around the Earth once every 24 hours. While our imaginary rocket ship continues its flight through space, we'll take time to find out some of the facts that scientists have learned about the Earth and the Moon. The Earth is a relatively small planet, about 8,000 miles in diameter. The Moon is even smaller, about 2,000 miles in diameter. The Earth's nearest neighbor is nearly 240,000 miles away. And all the while, the moon is in motion, revolving around the Earth. The moon's path around the Earth is called its orbit. It is shaped like an ellipse. The moon completes one trip around the Earth in about four weeks. It is a very difficult target to reach. The path of our flight into space and the path of the moon should cross at this point. By careful planning, we and the moon should arrive at the same point in space at the same time. We've already mentioned the force of gravity on Earth. But not only the Earth, the moon also has its own force of gravity. As the moon is considerably smaller than the Earth, the pull or force of gravity on the moon is much weaker than on the Earth. When the speed of our craft reaches about 25,000 miles per hour, we cut our rockets. If no outside forces were acting on the ship, we would continue in a straight line without decreasing our speed. But since the Earth's pull of gravity is acting on our ship, it gradually slows us down and would pull us back. But we have reached the point where the moon's gravity begins to act on the ship, causing it to gain speed again. Soon we will need to use braking power to avoid crashing on the moon. By speeded up photography, we can observe the moon going through its phases. Like the Earth and the planets, the moon shines because it reflects light from the sun. It has no light of its own. The moon waxes to a full moon in about two weeks and then wanes in about two more weeks to a new moon. During the moon's swing around the Earth, the shadows cast by the steady rays of the sun reveal the rugged nature of the moon's surface. Here you see the moon going through its eternal cycle of change that takes nearly a month to complete. Now let's take a look at some of its physical features at half moon as we would see it from our ship. 
Our scientists tell us that the moon is made of the same materials as the earth. As on the earth, there are mountain ranges on the moon. Here are three of them, with peaks reaching up to 20,000 feet in height. Some of the mountain chains are named after those on earth, the Alps, the Apennines, and the Carpathians. There are thousands of large and small craters on the moon. Some are gigantic. Many of them are named for great philosophers and scientists. For example, there is Copernicus. The darker areas were once thought to be seas or oceans. Ancient astronomers gave them fanciful names, like the Sea of Tranquility, the Sea of Serenity, and the Sea of Showers. They seem smoother and lower than other parts of the moon. From our present position, the moon may look like this. From the Earth, if you live north of the equator, you will see the moon in this position. See, here is the lady in the moon. But south of the equator, in Australia for example, you may be able to see the old man with the bundle of sticks. Or perhaps you can imagine other figures on the moon. While thinking of faces, let's give the moon some features. They will help show why it always faces the Earth. At the same time the moon makes one complete turn on its axis, it makes one trip around the Earth. That is why we never see the other side of the moon. Let's chart our course of travel over the moon. We plan not to land on this imaginary trip. Starting in the south, we'll fly near the craters Clavius and Tycho. We'll cross immense valleys and rills on our way to the north. We'll see the ray system of Copernicus, which spreads out over the Sea of Showers. And then we'll turn for a close look at three more craters and the Apennine mountain range. From there, we will again view Copernicus, make a side trip to see more mountains and rills, and then return home to Earth. Now our ship is traveling at a speed of about 5,200 miles an hour. This means that we'll be over the moon's surface in less than an hour. We'll come in from around the terminator or shadow side of the moon. As we near its surface, the moon seems to grow larger by the minute. How bleak and battered it appears. Here is but a small number of the thousands of craters which cover the moon's surface. There, coming into view, is Clavius, one of the largest craters on the moon. It's about 146 miles in diameter. And there is Tycho, a magnificent crater with a spectacular ray system spreading out for over a thousand miles. During a full moon, you can see it from Earth without the aid of a telescope. Other prominent features of the moon are its fissures or rills. Some are many miles in length and form deep canyons of unknown depths. Scientists think that they may have been formed by moon quakes, similar to our earthquakes. Since there is no water on the moon, they must not have been caused by water erosion. And there is Copernicus, with a ray system second in size only to that of Tycho. Later, we'll get a closer view. Here are the areas that have sometimes been called seas. If they are not seas, what are they? Scientists believe that many millions of years ago, these were lakes of melted rock. See the ripples on the surface? These ripples no longer move or change. They probably became solidly frozen ages ago when the melted rock cooled. After the cooling, one lunar day or night, there came a tremendous explosion, and the larger crater, Aristolus, was formed. A huge meteor blasted a crater 35 miles in diameter. Next to it is the crater Autolycus, smaller but quite impressive. To the right are the remaining walls of the crater Archimedes. Sometime in the distant past, molten lava leveled its turbulent floor. Our ship continues toward the Apennines. 
it is almost lost from sight against this land of sharp contrasts. Yet how dull everything looks, like burned out cinders. The tremendous changes in temperature that affected the moon in past eras have cracked the rocks into smaller and smaller parts until now there remains a fine layer of dust that covers much of the moon's surface. That mountain range ahead is the Apennines. The Apennines are by far one of the most important ranges on the moon. In the glaring sun, their cliffs thrust themselves upward from the dark bed of the Sea of Showers. Towering peaks reach above the rugged surface of the range. These mountains have jagged edges because there is neither water nor wind to wear them away. They are believed to be about the same height as the Alps in Switzerland. There's our rocket ship, can you see it? It's just below the center of the crater Copernicus. Like many other craters on the moon, Copernicus has a cluster of mountains in its center. The ring of rock walls that surrounds them is over 56 miles in diameter and rises about 12,000 feet above the crater floor. We'll travel for a while closer to the surface. Here too, the colors are dull and lifeless. Astronomers once believed that the craters were created by volcanic eruptions at the time when the moon was young. Now, most astronomers believe that the craters were formed by large meteors that collided with the moon sometime in the remote past. Such collisions make no sound, for on the moon there is no air, and without air there can be no sound. Remember the rills we saw earlier on our journey? Here we can get a closer look at some of them. The crevices in the moon's surface are deep, and their sides are steep. Many of these crevices are well hidden in the blackest of shadows. Now the shadows have almost disappeared. This means that where we are, it is noon, by moon or lunar time. Let's check the moon's temperature at midday with this special instrument. We'll take a reading. The temperature is 212 degrees Fahrenheit, or 100 degrees centigrade. That's the temperature of boiling water at sea level on Earth. In the shadows away from the sun, the temperature is below the freezing point of water on Earth. During the lunar night, temperatures drop as low as minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit. On this imaginary trip, let's leave a marker to identify our exploration. Down it goes. Even though it's made of heavy metal, notice how the marker bounces. That's because of the moon's weak gravity. The moon's mass is smaller than that of the Earth, and so its gravity is also smaller. And because of this, a person who weighs 180 pounds on Earth would weigh on the moon only about 30 pounds, one-sixth as much as on Earth. Imagine how high you could jump on the moon. But back to the marker. It is gradually being hidden in deep shadow, and now it becomes completely invisible. That's because there is no air, no floating dust, and no moisture on the moon to scatter the light. The spotlight would show that the marker is still there. Now we are ready to leave this land of utter silence, where temperatures range over 400 degrees on the Fahrenheit scale. It is reassuring to see on the horizon our own home base, our planet Earth, waiting for our return. So far, our trip has been an imaginary one. But on October 7, 1959, the Russians sent the first successful probe from the Earth to the Moon. The probe circled the moon, took a picture of the other side of the moon, and on the return trip, televised this picture back to Earth. 
now we have at least an imperfect view of what appears to be the other side of the moon. In comparison, the far side of the moon seems smoother and less rugged. No doubt this is only a beginning.